Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Uh, I think I can do this without the mics for a moment. Um, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome back to the Peterson Institute for International Economics. I'm Adam Posen, president of the Peterson Institute, and it is pleasure is not quite the right word, but it is my moment of pride and satisfaction to be inviting you to the second annual O. John O.K. lecture on ethics and economics. And we are very honored and could not have a more appropriate speaker today than the Honorable Sheila C. Baer, former chair of the Deposit Insurance Corporation and now president of Washington College. I will return to her in a moment. Um, as I hope many of you are aware, uh, we, we at the Peterson Institute, or at least most of us, maybe I'm an exception, are not uh, neoclassical robots without ethical concerns for the people affected by economics. Um, and uh, for some time, we have tried to grapple indirectly and directly with these issues. Um, I've had distributed today flyers for two recent books of ours that I think go more directly to these issues than many of the ones we've done in the past. Uh, Steve Wiseman's The Great Trade-Off on Ethics and Globalization, which was supported by a generous grant from the Stavros Niarchos Foundation, and Carolyn Freund's Rich People, Poor Countries, which was supported by a generous grant from the Aranda Foundation. And so we have found partners to help us do this type of long-term, somewhat risky, especially for economists' work, to think about what constitutes the nexus between ethical treatment of citizens, ethical treatment of businesses, ethical treatment of societies, and economic behavior. This was a particular concern, not just in theory, but in practice everyday life, of old John Olke. Um, he is a dear friend who many of us miss. It's over a year since John passed away after a very brave fight with cancer. Um, his friends and many colleagues through the years came together under, with the blessing of Phoebe Miller Oke, John's wife, and Charlotte Soraya Oke, uh, his daughter, who are with us today, to endow this lecture series at the Institute. Um, John, in the last few years of his life, was a very active advisor in formal and informal senses to the Institute, primarily informal and substantive, uh, particularly on the issues of financial regulation, of banking, of central banking and monetary policy. Uh, there are many of the fellows from the Institute here today at lunch who remember him fondly and benefited greatly from those interactions. John was born in Izmir, Turkey, graduated from Robert College in Istanbul, but then went on to get an MA and MBA from the Wharton School. Early on, through the end of his career, he was involved in international finance. He was a vice president of the Bank of New York, helped establish their first international office in London. He was one of the first members of the London Stock Exchange, not born in the UK or the Commonwealth. And in 1974, he launched a pioneering joint effort with New York's Fisher, Francis, Trees, and Watts to advise central banks and multinational companies on their US dollar portfolios. And it was in part through that work, uh, as well as his many colleagues in academia, that I got to know John. Uh, he was a trusted advisor to central bankers, in particular around the world, from Singapore to Switzerland and in between, and not just on very practical issues of reserve management, but also on conduct and strategy. Um, he became, in the end, Vice Chairman and Managing Director of Fisher Francis Trees and Watts, but he also was affiliated with the Netherlands-based Aegon, a, one of the world's largest insurance firms, serving on the boards eventually of the North American subs and then on the supervisory board of the whole company, and we're delighted to have represented here today a good friend of the Institute, Frank Rubzinski, who works with Aegon Asset Management in New John. Um, I can go on much longer because John was also a dear personal friend of mine, but just to say that it is entirely fitting given his commitment to bringing both the intellectual and the human decency into his everyday professional life and to the number of people that he mentored, including me, that he wanted 
and his family wanted part of his legacy in a formal sense to be this lecture series. And we're very proud and honored to have this be the second annual lecture. As I said, and it is not empty praise, I hope now is clear, we could not ask for a better lecturer this year than Professor Sheila Baer. Um, she has so many titles, of course, she is now the president of Washington College. Uh, she is, of course, honorable, having served quite honorably uh, in the leadership of the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation. Um, she had previously been the 19th chairman of the FDIC from June 2006 through July 2011, which, as you might recognize, was a particularly interesting period to be a bank supervisor. Um, before joining the FDIC, she was Dean's Professor of Financial Regulatory Policy at the University of Massachusetts Amherst. She included distinguished service at the U.S. Treasury as Assistant Secretary for Financial Institutions in 2001-2002, as Senior Vice President for Government Relations at the New York Stock Exchange, as a Commissioner of the Commodity Futures Trading Commission, and going back a little ways as Research Director and Counsel to Senate Majority Leader, then Senate Majority Leader Robert Dole. Um, the, the title that Sheila gave us for her talk today, which I was delighted to have, is The Role of Personal Accountability and Economic Incentives in Ethical Behavior. This is something that gets talked about a lot, but almost never addressed head on, particularly by someone with the real world regulatory, supervisory, and legal experience that Sheila Baird brings. So please join me in welcoming Commissioner Baird. Thank you, Adam. That was a very nice introduction, and it's a, a true pleasure to be here. I've uh, attended a number of functions with the Peterson Institute, and uh, I just uh, have tremendous respect for the independence and quality of the research and speaker series that you perform. Uh, you, are, you are a voice of truth in a time when we need uh, voices of truth. Um, <clears throat> this uh, might surprise you, uh, talking about ethics in the financial sector this morning, but I, I'm going to begin by defending capitalism a little bit. You know, I, I, uh, <laughs> I, I tell people I'm a capitalist, I'm still a capitalist, and they, and they don't believe me, uh, but I do. Uh, you know, I, I view capitalism as an instrument of moral behavior, uh, not an obstruction if, if, uh, if incentives are aligned uh, the way they should be, because I think uh, a properly uh, functioning capitalistic market-based system can provide very powerful incentives to do the right thing. But that functioning absolutely relies on the accountability of the people who are participating in that market. And most clearly, they need to understand that they will either benefit or suffer from the consequences of their actions. Uh, you know, without the ability to reap profits from risk taking, we would have no innovation, we'd have no growth, we'd have no progress. Um, I recently did a, an ad, an IBM Watson ad. I don't know if you, that was one of the more fun things I've ever done. And uh, when we were filming it, it was on risk management. When we were filming it, uh, we started off with a script. And we, we kind of used the script. And then we just kind of started talking and uh, with Watson. <laughs> and I started saying positive things about risk. And I think that surprised that, well, you know, risk, risk, that's what, what caused the financial crisis. But, but risk is absolutely a good thing if you understand it and you manage it. Most importantly, you know, you're willing to take the consequences. So if your risk pays off, good for you. Take whatever gains there are, but if the risk doesn't pay off, the consequences uh, should be yours, uh, not the rest of us. Because without the certainty that the risk taker, whoever that decision maker is, is going to suffer the consequences, the risk taking will be highly undisciplined. And more importantly, they will never learn from their mistakes. If they don't uh, own their mistakes, they will never learn from it. So my view of the, the lessons of the crisis really is that market forces were, were way out of kilter. And that the goal of regulation, the reform effort, and I think this is true in some respects and not true in other respects, but the overarching goal should be to try to realign those market forces so they work in favor of system stability and moral behavior, if you will, uh, not, that, uh, not that they undermine it. And my fear is, though, that a le the lesson that a lot of people take away from the crisis is that the market cannot be trusted. Market forces give up on them and that we just basically have to have really prescriptive, uh, detailed regulation dictating everything uh, that everybody does. And I think that's the wrong lesson, uh, because I think that kind of regulation is generally uh, in the long run, uh, and sometimes in the short run, not very effective. 
But I, I can say as a former government official and regulator that I think one of the reasons it's been hard for regulators to come to grips with some of the misaligned incentives uh, that brought us the 2008 crisis was because, frankly, government was responsible for some of these uh, misaligned incentives. And there, first and foremost, we should be trying to correct those. And there again, I think we've got a, a, a mixed record. Um, now, that's not to, to let Wall Street off the hook, not in any way. Uh, you know, it's been said that Wall Street greed and excessive risk taking caused the crisis. Um, and I've said that. And I would agree that uh, greed was certainly a primary factor. But when have we not had greed on Wall Street? I mean, you know, <laughs> it's, uh, and, uh, you know, so what was different about it that, that brought us in the early 2000s and the first decade of this century uh, to bring us the financial crisis of 2008? And, and I do, uh, you know, there's a lot of talks about ethics and culture, Wall Street culture, and we've got to change that, and I'm all for that. And I think, you know, I, I you know, you can re rehabilitate people one by one, and by talking about it and regulators having these initiatives, you can just convince a few people uh, in leadership positions. That's a good thing, but I think we also need to be realistic. And uh, the financial sector is, it's a bit of a self-selection process. And especially, you know, the traders and the people that are really out there taking the big risk and trying to reap the big profits, they're gonna, they're gonna understand two things. They're gonna under understand poverty or they're gonna stand jail. <laughs> So, you know, to say we're going to have some big code of ethics and, and change the world and, and link arms and have a, a big kumbaya moment, I think, is not realistic. And I do worry that, uh, again, I think discussion on ethics and culture is one we absolutely have to have, but it shouldn't be a diversion from good, strong, common sense regulation effectively and uh, vigorously uh, uh, enforced. I would also suggest that, you know, that uh, you know, so put greed aside. We've always had greed. So what else was going on? I actually, looking back on the key drivers uh, of the crisis, the, 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 the conduct that brought us so much instability, it was not so much a knowing and reckless assumption of risk. I think it was really a, a lot of, uh, of uh, financial engineering that was facilitated in many ways by government to avoid the risk of consequences. And uh, if, you look, if you look at the major uh, problems that we had, leverage, short-term wholesale funding, securitization, credit default swaps, these are all weapons <laughs> that were really uh, designed to allow market participants to avoid accountability for the decision-making, to put the loss off on somebody else. And uh, each were enabled in various ways uh, by the government and regulatory policies that were being pursued during the great uh, so-called moderation. So, so let's talk about capital first. I know there are a lot of people in the room who share my passion for strengthening uh, capital requirements and uh, significantly reduce the amount of leverage a lot, lot, large financial institutions uh, can assume to function. Uh, you know, prior to the crisis, equity owners had very, very little skin in game. And so these big banks and other large financial institutions, they were playing with other people's money. And uh, inst the institutional bond investors, you would have thought they should have been watching. So why, if you, if you look at the, the amount of leverage uh, that uh, these, and the investment banks, I mean, I've, I've seen studies, you know, showing Lehman Brothers and Bear at 40, 50 to 1, if you, if you count, you know, if you adjust all the, the, uh, the window dressing and things uh, they were doing. So the leverage had kind of completely gotten out of hand. And you wonder, uh, so the shareholders, you can understand they would like that because, you know, while it works, it works great and you're, return on equities are really quite uh, significant, but why in the world uh, were bondholders uh, uh, tolerating that? And I think a lot of it was an assumption for the larger institutions was an assumption of too big to fail. And uh, they thought, and frankly they thought right, that the Fed and the Treasury and the government generally uh, were not gonna let them take losses because they were funding these big financial institutions with all of their connections to government. So I do think People talk about too big to fail, and there's a debate about its role, but I do think to the extent it, uh, and the rating agencies obviously were complicit there too, but to the extent too big to fail, whether it was implicit or explicit in the, in the minds of, of those lending money to the big banks, uh, it was absolutely a, a huge driver. And there again, too big to fail is classic, you know, protecting people from their, uh, letting them uh, privatize the losses and putting the, lo putting, excuse me, privatizing the gains and putting the losses on other people, escape, escaping the consequences of their, of their own actions. I think the, um, the problem was also skewed by what we call risk-based capital ratios, and I just, I know a lot of you are, are uh, very familiar with bank regulation as I look in the audience, but we basically have two types of 
limits on the ability of a bank to borrow money to fund its balance sheet. One is the leverage ratio, which is simply a, a limit on uh, or a minimum requirement for the amount of equity you have to use to fund yourself. And then we have risk-based capital standards, which are which is uh, the regulators actually try to decide what on your balance sheet and some of your off-balance sheet exposures to how risky they are. And so if the if the regulators decide that your your, your exposures are less risky, you can actually report a much higher uh, capital ratio than some other uh, bank with exactly the same amount of, of equity, uh, but with, uh, with a balance sheet that the regulators view is, is higher risk. So in, point, in, in short, regulators, through this risk-based capital regime, decide what's risky and what isn't. And they were wrong. You know, they were, they were completely wrong. Uh, in Europe, they said sovereign debt wasn't risky. Uh, in the U.S., we said uh, mortgage securitizations uh, weren't risky. And, and credit default swaps weren't risky. Actually, the credit fault swaps are somehow reducing risk. And so, I, but here again, I think uh, the willingness of the market to let regulators decide for themselves instead of taking their own accountability for looking at bank balance sheets and deciding what, what their view of risk uh, was, uh, was a detriment. And uh, I think this is, this is best illustrated with the SEC's rules, capital rules in 2004, where they finalized uh, the so-called inter internal ratings-based approach for uh, consolidated capital for investment banks. Prior to that time, you only had the uh, net capital rule for the broker-dealer. You didn't have consolidated capital uh, standards. Uh, so the SEC went forward in 2004 with a, with a, uh, 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 a, a approach that the bank regulators had actually developed. And we had stopped for commercial banks, and the FDIC was very opposed. But they went, we went through with it. And it was, uh, it was based on the bank's own internal models, basically, to decide how risky they were and, therefore, how much capital they had to have. And uh, you look again, if you look at the, so the, the investment bank leverage prior to 2004, I think it was about 12 to 1, 14 to 1. After 2004, once the government said, hey, it's okay for them to take on this much leverage, they don't have very risky balance sheets. We've got this fancy new uh, risk-weighted uh, risk, uh, uh, capital regime. The market tolerated extreme levels of, of, uh, of uh, leverage. And I think there again, the government had a, con uh, by assuming responsibility for the, what should have been the market's own decision making, it created instability. Liquidity was another place where I think government policies uh, played a role. So not only were banks borrowing too much to fund themselves, but they were borrowing very short. And they were lending to each other very short, right? And here again, uh, this was uh, encouraged by government capital rules that basically said, well, a short-term loan is a lot lower risk than a long-term loan, right? You've only got exposure for a couple of days versus several years, so that's lower risk. And then the government also said, well, lending between banks is lower risk, right? So if, if it's a bank lending, uh, lend, banks lending to each other, that's a really low risk transaction. Then finally, they said if the lending is collateralized by government debt, it has no risk at all. So with, with those types of incentives built in, uh, you know, and there again, the government's saying it's okay, it's low risk. Um, that is exactly the funding model uh, that was used by these large financial institutions, and it was disastrous. Uh, during the crisis because once people figured out that, you know, with Lehman Brothers, oh, well, boy, maybe somebody can fail. Nobody wanted to lend to banks anymore, including banks didn't want to lend to each other, and they had huge amounts of, uh, of expiring debt that they needed to roll, and you didn't have uh, anybody on the other side to take it, which is one of the reasons why my agency had to step in and guarantee a lot of debt for a temporary period of time to allow them to... Uh, roll this uh, short-term debt and fund themselves, uh, which was not something I particularly was, was uh, happy about doing. Securitization was a classic example of financial engineering to escape responsibility. And there again, the capital regulations encouraged it. So the old-fashioned way of making a mortgage, make a loan, put it on your books, hope the, hope the borrower pays it. Uh, and uh, you're very careful about making that mortgage because if uh, the, the borrower doesn't pay, the loss is yours. The securitization, the whole new paradigm was the origination decision, the decision to make and fund the loan was completely separated from the investors who were holding uh, the long tail of risk in terms of whether that mortgage would, uh, would pay. And there again, and it seemed logical at the time, the capital regulations said, okay, well, it's a lot lower risk for you to securitize your loans. If you sell it off completely, uh, we're not even going to make you hold any capital on it. It's off your balance sheet. Even if you buy the mortgage-backed securities off, if you have the so-called top tranche, we're going to have a much lower uh, capital charge than if you just hold the mortgage in portfolio. So, again, this, this is, uh, and, and this is still the case. This is still the kind of uh, incentive that, the incentives that are created through our capital regime. 
And so that's exactly what happened. And uh, but nobody thought about well, if you're severing the decision to make the loan from the consequence, the consequence of your action, the consequence of that loan going bad and not being repaid, how is that going to impact incentives? And what you saw was securitization, mortgage origination became a volume-driven business. Everybody just you know get those mortgages in the door. We don't care if they're going to pay off because we're going to sell them off, and they're paying us actually bigger fees. Uh, if we give the, if we originate a high risk mortgage with a big interest rate reset, then, uh, then we get paid if we do a nice, uh, safe, uh, 30 year fixed uh, rate loan. So that, uh, that more than anything, I think was the, was the, the core of the crisis. And that was probably about a hundred, hundred, uh, a few hundred billion in losses. But what really, uh, caused the problem was all the credit default swaps that were written, all the bets, all the bets that were made on top of those, uh, all those bad uh, mortgages about whether they would pay off or not. And that was uh, many trillions of dollars. And there again, the credit default swap market was designed, it was explicitly designed to insulate people <clears throat> from, the, from credit risk, from, from having to make a decision about the, 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 uh, the credit uh, risk worthiness of an investment, uh, just buy some CDS protection. And not only that, but uh, so, we, and we gave very favorable uh, bankruptcy treatment to credit default swaps, which is still the case, favorable tax treatment, accounting treatment. And, uh, and if you had a matched book, uh, uh, capital treatment as well. And uh, we never, it was insurance, but, and you know, anybody in the insurance business knows that you create a lot of bad incentives if you don't require some insurable interest. When somebody comes to buy fire protection on their house, you wanna make sure they own the house. Uh, but we didn't do that with credit default swaps. Um, so again, um, it was creating a false impression of insulation from loss, insulation from the consequences of your action. And, uh, and even if, uh, you know, the entity your counterparty uh, uh, failed, as, as we saw with Lehman Brothers, Congress had given derivatives counterparties super priority uh, in the bankruptcy code. So you could grab your collateral and, and run away as fast as you could. You didn't have to get in line behind all those creditors. So again, uh, this, uh, this sense of security and insulation from consequences through, uh, through this product, which again was, was facilitated by, by tax laws, bankruptcy laws, as well as, as capital treatment. And then fine, of course, the, the, big, the big one, the big one that, uh, that uh, gave everybody this, uh, this sense that they didn't have to worry about consequences was what we now call the Greenspan put, and this, you know, this overarching distortion that was created by highly accommodative monetary policy, which I think in retrospect, and it seemed to work at the time, but in retrospect, I think it interfered with the cleansing process that comes with cycles. And uh, more importantly, I think uh, a lot of managers and financial institutions got confused about the great moderation. It was because they thought they were so smart and not just because uh, the Fed had figured out um, how, to, how to really uh, mitigate and cushion uh, market uh, upsides and downsides. So. And then when it, you know, the shock of having losses and being not just in a cycle, but in a, a deep, uh, a devastating cycle, the, the, the hurrying to DC for bailouts, uh, because, uh, you know, they didn't, the system was not resilient. They were used to being bailed out. And unfortunately, if you're with monetary policy since 2008, we've, we've somewhat doubled down on that model. And that's, that's the subject of another discussion. But anyway, so how, to what extent, so we've had these market distortions, we've had, uh, I, and I think it centered around uh, stakeholders not having consequences and not having the consequences and accountability fit into their mindset. And so how, what have we done to, to realign those economic incentives to make sure they know they will suffer the financial quality, they get the benefits, but they also suffer the financial consequences if their risks uh, go wrong. And so I, I do think there's been a very, very uh, large focus on capital, and I applaud that. Uh, we've got the leverage ratio up significantly. Uh, the risk-based capital ratios have also gone up significantly, but we still have the risk-based uh, framework. And uh, I do think that that is just uh, one of the lessons of the I, I'm actually getting to the point where I think we should scrap risk-based capital, just have a, have a stress testing process and a leverage ratio, because I think it's very difficult especially through a rulemaking process for regulators to decide what's risky and what isn't. Risk is very fluid. Mortgages used to be thought of as risky, sovereign, excuse me, as low risk. Sovereign debt used to be thought of as low risk. I don't think, uh, I don't think uh, uh, you can decide that by regulation. It's too static, and I think it's very, government, very hard for the government to decide that for the market. But again, if you've got the government deciding what is risky or not, you're gonna have the market relying on that you get this herd mentality into certain asset classes, 
which creates additional instability. So I, I applaud the focus on capital, forcing shareholders to have more skin in the game. That's exactly the kind of alignment of economic incentives that we need. But again, the government's so intrusively deciding what's risky or not, I think it is very, uh, very bad for market stability. Same problem with liquidity rules. We certainly needed liquidity rules given the excessive reliance on short-term financing by the large financial institutions. But I really wish the focus had been more on the duration of the liability side of their balance sheet, not so much about whether they were holding quote unquote liquid assets. There again, I think the government's setting itself up by defining what's liquid and what, what isn't. You're creating a herd mentality uh, into certain asset classes. And we're seeing it both the SEC and, and the bank regulators are going in this direction. And I fear that what the regulators are saying now as a liquid instrument, based on past performance, may not be in a rising interest rate environment. Uh, you know, just as we were looking at mortgages as safe, because for decades mortgages have performed well, well, we're looking at certain, you know, sovereign debt and high, highly rated debt as something that's safe based on past history. But, you know, how long has it been since we've been in a rising interest rate environment? We just don't know how those instruments are going to perform. And also just the thought of, of a system whereby banks are going to be raising liquidity theoretically by dumping, you know, dumping securities on the market to raise cash. You want them buying, not selling. So I think I very much worry about uh, the approach on liquidity that we've been taking. The Volcker rule, I think, is great. I think it has had a good impact. It is, though, a prescriptive rule. And i got to tell you, I think the Volcker rule would have been so much, so much more effective if it had also included a ban on bonuses based on trading profits, right? So you're telling these traders, don't, don't speculate, don't generate uh, trading profits through speculation. We want you to serve customer interest. On the other hand, it's okay for them to get a big bonus if they make trading profits. So again, I think through an alignment of economic incentives, we would have had a more effective rule. Risk retention on securitization, that was mandated uh, in, uh, at least I thought it was mandated in Dodd-Frank, and I'm afraid we just capitulated on that. So um, at least for mortgage securitizations, there's effectively no meaningful risk retention. So you still have this severance of uh, the origination decision from the, the holding of risk. And we do have, a, we do at least have lending standards uh, at, the, uh, at the Consumer Bureau. Uh, they're under relentless pressure, constant to weaken those. So I think we're all in on that. And again, by aligning those economic incentives and requiring securitizers to keep some of the skin in the game, make them take the losses if those mortgages don't perform, I think that would have uh, been a much more effective approach than, than what we ended up doing. And finally, I think the most recent spate of rulemakings, in, in my view, are, they're, they're saving the best for last. I don't know if that's how they, uh, they intended it, probably not. But what you're seeing with resolution authority, with uh, total loss absorbing capital, and even compensation rules now, I think those really get to the heart of aligning economic incentives. So having credible, credible plans that are public about how this bank will be resolved or other financial institution, the market can see it and know it and understand it. They're taking the losses. Total loss absorbing capital, that's just a way to force uh, very large financial organizations to issue a lot of long-term debt at the holding company level to bond investors, uh, force them. They've got to sell it uh, at whatever uh, price they need to pay for it. And that is clearly going to be on the first line of, of, of loss, and it would be hard for anybody, I think, to try to say they thought they were going to bail out by buying TLAC. But I think that the market discipline that that will bring and the increased uh, funding cost by the, by the higher risk institutions because the bonds will be very uh, difficult and expensive to sell, I think that will have a huge impact on better aligning economic incentives to address some of the distortions we saw prior to the crisis. And then finally, on compensation, uh, you know, I think uh, it's not the way I would have done it, uh, but I think at least they're focusing on it uh, is, you know, because what, what drives behavior? Absolutely. Uh, what you're going to get paid and how you're going to get paid and the kind of activity that, that companies reward and the kind of activity that they do not. So I'm not sure the rules are, are the best approach, but I'm glad at least they're out there. They're talking about it. They're going to be getting some good feedback. And I, I do think that that is uh, an important aspect, a necessary of, uh, of uh, financial reform. So excuse the Puritan in me, but I really do think holding people responsible for their actions is, 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 should be the overarching, overarching uh, philosophy or theory that guides all of our reform efforts. I think in some cases that has been true. In other cases, it has not been. Uh, I do worry about uh, talk about expanding the safety net. Um, we saw yesterday a Fed official talking about expanding uh, discount window lending 
to <laughs> yeah to broker dealers and other uh, uh, you know uh, subsidiaries and uh, and holding companies. Right now, the Fed can only lend uh, to uh, to insured depositories. That would be a very very significant expansion of the safety net. And of course, Dodd Frank. Uh, already uh, opened access uh, to Fed lending by financial market utilities, clearing houses, which didn't have, were actually functioned reasonably well during the crisis. So um, I think they're, again, by insulating people from the consequences of their action, by getting into their mind, they can put the losses on somebody else, and the Fed in this case, I think you end up destabilizing, uh, having a destabilizing uh, impact. But uh, it, is, uh, it is what it is. Um, so I think, you know, finally, we're all uh, fighting for the narrative about was caused the financial crisis. I assume all of you saw the big short, or most of you. How many saw the big short? I just, yeah, okay, all right, yeah. So, you know, um, it, it's funny how, uh, how strongly Wall Street reacted to the, to the narrative of that. Of course, the, the, the other narratives are, you know, it's, it's the poor people made us do it, so right, it was all the government trying to get poor people in the houses, so that was the cause of the crisis. That, does anybody here believe that? I'll go into it. Why, that's not true, but okay. Um, the other one, there's the 100 year, what I call the Chinese savers made us do it. So, the, you know, the 100 year flood narrative and all this money coming into the uh, United States from China, and they just had to have product for it, and, and so that's what caused the crisis. But I do think uh, the big short narrative in terms of the instruments and behaviors that drove this, uh, but I think what they didn't really get into was the, some of the backstory about how the complex web of rules and government decision making that facilitated this, not through CRA, that's nonsense, but through some of the, uh, the capital rules and, and the favorable treatment, uh, uh, market treatment of derivatives um, that uh, really, I think, uh, are, are, should not be underestimated in terms of their underlying uh, uh, causes and, uh, and that really still need to be fixed uh, better than, than how we're handling it now. So um, that's, uh, I think that's the core problem that needs to be fixed. And uh, thank you for letting me uh, share my thoughts with you. It's all about personal accountability with me. It, it always is. And uh, hopefully uh, we've uh, all learned a bit of a lesson. We'll have to see the next time. I hope it doesn't take another crisis to get this really fixed. Thank you very much. Just to fill time while we get Sheila's mic in place, I will just review the ground rules here at the Peterson Institute. Uh, this event's on the record. It's being streamed live. It will be posted to our website, and if Washington College wants it, we'll love to have it on their website. Uh, we ask our distinguished guests to feel free to ask questions or make brief comments to, in response to Commissioner or President Baer's remarks. Uh, there is a traveling mic up front, which Jessica is holding. There's a standing mic at back. The two rules are, first, please identify yourself when you ask a question, and second, that you do not make a speech. Um, but before we do that, I just want to follow up, if I could. I love the way you, you, you talk about the Puritan in yourself. Yet, Puritans did things like, you know, burning witches, putting people in stocks. Um, and, and actually, I, I mean that in a good way. Um, so so there, remains, there remains, of course, a large number of people who perhaps would not be frustrated by your speech, but would be frustrated by the sense that we talk about individual accountability and no one's gone to jail. Right. Yeah. No one's, no one's, and you, you were talking still a lot in the abstract. Right. about um, basically financial engineering and incentives. Is it, is it unfair to talk about individual responsibilities to that next degree about personal culpability? No, no, no not at all. And I think uh, first and foremost, uh, well, I, I guess because I wanted to tie this sure, of course. to reform efforts, I talk about uh, particular types of conducts and products as opposed to individuals. But no, I mean, that, that is absolutely... Uh, been lacking, uh, the, the lack of consequences. And it doesn't, I mean, there, I think there are people who should have gone to jail that didn't. But I think there were also people who should have suffered severe financial consequences mm -hmm. that didn't. And it does trouble me that so many of these, we get these headline multi-billion dollar settlements, it's almost all being paid for by shareholders. 
And I don't, uh, you know, even, uh, I, and I think actually Hillary Clinton has got a proposal to require that the pay of the top officials, that gets, it gets paid out of their salary first before shareholders have to pay, which may be one approach to deal with this. But sometimes uh, financial incentives are more appropriate, but we really haven't even had that. And there are clearly some people who should have gone to jail too. And I, as I said earlier, I think the two biggest things, it, we can talk about culture and ethics right. and all of that and try to inspire, but at the end of the day, uh, people uh, understand financial consequences, which more I was talking about, and jail where it's appropriate. Mm -hmm. um, just secondly, you, you, you were very succinct and powerful on this, this idea of people feeling the consequences of their actions and things like securitization where you separate them from their actions. How much, among the policymakers who, 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 who allowed or encouraged these developments, how much do you think this was, they genuinely believed that this was a step forward in some sense? How much was this they got caught up in a sort of lemmings of, of oh, philosophy? Yes. How do you see these decisions coming about? Oh, I, I think they absolutely uh, thought it was a positive thing, and, and it seemed like it was for a while. And I think what, and I don't think securitization is bad. I, I think securitization actually done right is, is a good innovation, but the securitizers in particular need to, to retain some risk, some significant part of the risk, or you will have misaligned incentives. And I think that is what they missed. And the Fed, and Ellen Greenspan, who is accredited, has said since then, and Brim Bernanke has too, that the Fed should have written mortgage lending standards, and they didn't. They were still assuming markets would self-correct based on the old model of originators keeping the books, keeping the loans on their balance sheet, where they, they did have, the market did self discipline Securitization uh, broke that uh, broke that uh, relationship, and that's really what they missed. So I think, in, you know, I, again, I still think securitization is a good uh, is a good tool if done properly with with uh, meaningful risk retention. And I hope, even though the regulators haven't done that, I think a lot of investors are understanding it, which which is uh, good. But yeah, it was it was absolutely done for the right reasons. I don't want to suggest any of this was done because people were. I think, you know, there's this perception that regulators are just accommodating industry or whatever. I think at the time, there were, uh, there were reasons why they were making these decisions. But again, the lesson is they weren't focusing on economic incentives and how that would impact behavior. And that's where I, I think we're still missing it. Terrific. Thank you very much. Let me now open it up to the floor. If you'd like to ask a question or make a comment, please raise your hand to be recognized or stand up at the back mic. Oh dear, has the Puritan scared you? No, <laughs> here. No stock. Thank you. Frank Rubinsky from Agon Asset Management. Um, whenever you have a period of, of large policy or regulatory changes, uh, there always seems down the line to be some unintended consequences. Yeah. And just curious if you could talk about that. I mean, you know, from our uh, perspective, kind of the, the reduction in liquidity in the corporate bond market um, and kind of what that could mean yeah. down the road if you had a uh, se severe downturn. If you could just kind of talk about that and if you see any other uh, uh, potential consequences. Yeah, well, I, I, and I think that is a, a real issue. And I, I'm, not I'm not sure to what extent regulation is a piece of it. I think low interest rates are a piece of it. I think it's with you raise capital, bank capital levels, and then expect them to make markets and hold large portfolios of very, very low yielding assets, they're, they're probably not going to want to do that. So, and then, of course, the Fed itself has been buying a lot of that. Uh, so, uh, at least with mortgage bonds. So um, I think uh, there are a lot of different factors uh, in each of these things, raising capital, lowering interest rates, buying mortgage bonds, those all had you know, independent reasons for doing them. If you put them together, I think it's creating a bit of a, 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 an illiquidity situation. I do worry about volatility as interest rates go up. It hasn't been, well, we saw the first quarter, and we've seen the past couple of years, so we saw the, the, uh, the taper tantrum so how it's going to work, I don't have clarity. I think Janet Yellen is smart to do it very slowly and signal it as best as she can. I think that's the only way out. But it's clearly um, this combination of monetary policy and, and uh, regulatory reform is, is creating this exactly unintended consequence. Cool. At the back mic, please. Barry Wood, RTHK Hong Kong Radio. Ms. Baer, where did the Americans go wrong in the ethics that have led to this enormous wealth inequality. I'm thinking about the enormous salaries paid to chief executives, which really is a relatively recent phenomenon. How did it happen, and what can we do to remedy it? Well, it, it, is, uh, it is troubling. And 
and of course, that's not just the banks. That's, I mean, bank actually, bank pay has, has dropped in terms of, if you look at the top paid uh, CEOs now, it's, it's heavily dominated by the, by the tech sector. So um, I, it, it, as that said, whether that's justified or not is another question. I, you know, I think a lot of this comes to corporate boards and it comes to shareholders too, why shareholders put up with it. I mean, all that big money that's going into management is money that's not being... Uh, uh, you know, plowed back into the company for growth or, or distributed in dividends. So it's, uh, you're seeing them get a little more proactive, uh, but it's, uh, it's still not what it should be. Um, you know, too, and I, uh, I remember, uh, and I think reporters, there's, there's your journalists here, and I would, th would think about this, too, in terms of how you report on, on CEO pay, because I, I saw in New York, not to pick on the New York Times, but this is one thing where it, it did trouble me. They did a piece probably several months ago now about, women CEOs having higher pay, right? And so they listed all the top 100 CEOs and their pay, and they were celebrating the fact they were two or three women, you know, in the very uh, top tier now. And, you know, the, the names I was seeing in the top tier, of your, you know, top 15, 20, were really not names I would care to be associated mm -hmm. with because I think they were, you know, their companies weren't performing very well. They were just taking care of themselves. And I saw someone like Indra Nui. I saw her in the middle of the pack. She's a great CEO. She's done tremendous things at Pepsi. But I think, you know, her culture and her board's culture is one. They don't really want to be at the top. That's not really something they value. You want a fairly paid CEO. You want to be competitive and make sure you keep uh, talented CEOs. But it's more about that. It's about shareholder performance. It's about, it's about your customers. It's about your employees. And so um, I think, uh, you know, maybe more women. I know um, Christine Lagarde wants more women in finances, but I think maybe getting more women in top uh, top CEO levels uh, will also help, because I think the New York Times is putting a, a value judgment on high paid CEOs. I think the women themselves, by showing where they were ranked, um, I think uh, that was, uh, that was uh, showing their uh, understanding that the job is more than just, just the dollar amount attached to it. Uh, you unwittingly set me up for having to do more institute advertising. Okay. So besides the two ethically directed books that we published this year, we also published an important study by Marcus Nolan, Tyler Moran, and Barbara Kochwar on women in top management. We have the largest data set, uh, 96 countries, 91, sorry, uh, roughly 22,000 companies. And what we end up showing, or what Mark and co-authors end up showing very robustly is that the companies that do best get a profit most from women, but not just on the board or CEO, it's by being in the top ranks of, of management, yes. being a pipeline yeah, of management. That's absolutely true. And that, I think, is the same spirit right, as what you, were, what you were talking about. Exactly. Anyway, uh, there's two people at that table. Jessica, if you could give them the mic. Lee first, and then Joe. Uh, Lee Price at FDIC. So you made a reference at the end about incentive comp being one of the best to last, but you might have done it differently. And I was just, I don't want to get into the weeds, but just you must have some conceptual notions of how best to structure an incentive comp so that, so that yeah. you deal with some of these kind of incentives right. that lead to more too much risk right. without without. Yeah. Uh, so 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 two of my favorite. Well, I think first of all, basing compensation based on return on equity creates a lot of bad incentives, especially for banks that have so much, so many incentives to take on leverage to begin with. So having a, your top management and your top, uh, your top performers uh, bonuses tied to return on the equity, I think, again, that runs counter to what they're trying to do with, with increasing capital levels. So return on assets, I think, it's not perfect either, but it's a better metric. But you didn't really see any discussion of that. I think that the form of compensation matters too. So I did, I did notice that they said they, they wanted a good mix of cash and equity in, in the uh, in the variable pay and the in the bonus, but uh, you know I I think uh, paying bonuses at least in good part in in bonds, especially bonds that convert and are in a first loss position if the bank gets into trouble, there is that is another you know kind of an elegant simple way to very cleanly ally economic incentives because if you, if you if you keep it all based on shares and and those share grants are based on return on equity. They still have the economic incentives to do what they were doing prior to the crisis, right? Take on a lot of risk, juice up that share price in the short term, cash in when they can, and they're trying to mitigate that with the, with the clawback rules. But just pay them in, in debt, right? Their only upside is the interest rate they're going to get, and they've got a huge amount of downside if, if the bank gets into trouble. So I guess I would, I know that's more provocative and probably be more controversial. So maybe the regulators took the safer course, and I think it will help. You know, I think they're extending the, uh, the deferral period, they're increasing the percentage that needs to be deferred. I think those are all 
helpful things, but I guess I would have liked to have seen a little something a little uh, to use an overword uh, overused word uh, disruptive in terms of how bank officials are compensated. Very good, Joe. Next, and then we'll come to David. Um, thank you. Um, I'm Joe Gagnon, a senior fellow here at Peterson. Um, I wanted to ask you mentioned um, the, the Greenspan put and how you thought that was part of a problem. So I, I just wonder if you could explain a bit more. I can sort of think of three possibilities, maybe, or maybe you can tell me it's not, none of them, but one would be the Fed was behind the curve in the mid-2000s and was maybe too easy, and perhaps a lot of people would agree with that, uh, although I don't think that's what most people mean by the, the Greenspan put. Another would be that the Fed was too, too quick to lend to people during the crisis and set up programs for lending, but those were fully collateralized and didn't lose any money. And then the third might be that the Fed uh, lowered rates and, and did quantitative easing and stimulative policies too, too strongly, uh, but presumably that was to guard against excess unemployment. I mean, which of those is, is a worry or is there something else? Well, I think that this period of great moderation where we went through, I think everybody thought that, you know, we had licked risk and, uh, you, know, you know, we didn't need regulation anymore. And I think that was, you know, just highly accommodative, low interest rates, lowering interest rates every time we got into a bump very aggressively been keeping them there for a long period of time. So I do think that that people got a little lax uh, because the, the Fed was uh, protecting. I think I, I, that's not what I was referring to in terms of the bailout policies, that the Fed absolutely needed to open up the spigot in 2008 and 2009. I don't think there's any question of that. But I don't think, I think it's been unwise to keep it this low this long. And I know I hear that, well, this has helped unemployment and, and all of this. And, you know, how do you prove that's not the case? Uh, I know a lot of smart economists who think, it would have been better uh, for the economy if they had normalized more quickly. Um, I do think it's made income, back to the earlier question, I think it's made in income inequality and wealth inequality worse. It's inflated financial assets. Who owns financial assets? Not, not people making $50,000 a year. You know, I live, the college I run is in Chestertown, Maryland, a little town of 5,000 people. They're still struggling. There's not really been a re much of a recovery there. So I, I, I have a hard time getting excited about you know, you can't, it's hard to prove a negative, but I just think um, they made it too easy for, con and then they say, well, Congress doesn't do anything. Okay, but fine, but you're facilitating that, you're enabling that. We need fiscal policy, we need tax reform, we need infrastructure spending. Those are the kinds of things that would give us real economic growth and create jobs for those people uh, that, uh, you know, are trying to do the right thing for their families and their kids to college, like Washington College. And we're not getting that. You can't do that through monetary policy. It's a cyclical tool. It's not a structural tool. And it creates a lot of distortions um, that we're, we're still seeing. And, uh, you know, I, I, I fear it will end badly. I really do. Okay. At the back mic, then in front here, and then the final one over there. Thanks. I'm Sean Donnelly from the U.S. Council for International Business. Thanks for a great presentation. I have a sense that out there in the public, there's a widely held view that there was a, a lot of criminal behavior in the banks and beyond, and that the system has failed, nobody's been prosecuted, and uh, could you comment on that, and, and if so, if, you know, what that, you know, what you think happened and why it did or didn't happen? Yeah. Thanks. Well, that's, uh, you know, what is it, the, the joke between uh, stupid and criminal and, <laughs> and, and the big short. So it's not clear where stupid ended and, and uh, stupid and greed ended and fraud began. I mean, there was, there was widespread fraud at the origination level. There, there's no doubt about that. How far knowledge of that went up, uh, the management chain, um, is, is uh, difficult to know. I think there are some of the, uh, you know, I, I think there are some of the, the leaders of the subprime mess, uh, a few West Coast thrifts. I can think of one in particular uh, that B of A bought and probably it's just to get the peeps on giving. You know, you can't tell me there wasn't criminal behavior going on at Countrywide at the higher levels. I mean, look, at, that place was a, you know, anyway, I, I just, so, so it's kind of indescribable to me. And I said, these very large banks and everybody wants the head of the, the CEOs of the too big to fail institutions. It's really not clear to me that, it, that they knew about it or how far up it went. And in some, um, you know, like Wells Fargo, J.P. Morgan Chase, they're not perfect. They've made mistakes later. J.P. Morgan Chase certainly has. But they weren't. I mean, they got out. Uh, Wells Fargo never really got in. And J.P. Morgan Chase stopped in 2006. They saw it was happening. So uh, I, I don't think uh, maybe the heads that people want and the heads of people who actually were culpable may not be the same. But the point is, is that there were clearly were people at executive level that should have been brought to task, and some should have been put in jail who were not. 
And then the financial penalties should not have been borne by shareholders the way they were. And there were too few, and frankly, there were too few jobs left uh, lost there too. I mean, at Citigroup, that's legend. Um, the struggles we had there just to get management and board changes. Um, there was just a big, big resistance uh, to doing that. And uh, and I don't get that. I really don't. I, the argument given to me was well, that'll stabilize the system if you fire people. And I, you know, or that these AIG traders in London, what the heck were we paying them bonuses for? I don't get that. I mean, I think, you know, people who have made mistakes like that, the market likes it when you fire and replace them with somebody else. I, you know, so that that uh, that still is a mystery to me, and I get angry too. I think people uh, there are a lot more repercussions that should have been suffered. Maybe not jail with a lot. There is some uh, that would be at the top of my list, but certainly lost jobs and law and uh, financial penalties uh, could have been much greater use, and and we just didn't see it. Thank you. At the front here, please. Um, I, I'm Damon Silvers. Um, I, I work for the AFL-CIO, but as I was on the Congressional Oversight Panel for TARP, um, I, I, just an observation about what you just said and then a question that goes back earlier. Um, it, it's, it, I, I think what you just said is really important because it links the decision not for, for there not to be financial consequences for those who took risks to the decisions not to enforce the law later. Right. Th those two things, yeah, it seemed sure. to me as an observer at the time, were they were one decision. Yeah. Um, uh, the question I had for you, though, is um, the totality of your talk uh, seeks to draw a distinction between, to some degree, between private action and government action. And you, you touched on this a little bit, but I wanted to push you on it. Okay. Um, it's hard, it's hard, it was hard for me to see at the time much distinction between the two. And I, but by the time, I don't mean during the crisis. I mean during the years before the crisis right. in policy making. Can you think of an example where the, where, where, where the government did something that decreased, accountab that decreased accountability uh, that the private sector opposed, that the, that the, the banks, the, the investment banks, et cetera, et cetera, didn't want to have happen? That something that decreased accountability that they didn't want to happen. Yeah, I mean, no. I, I mean, you you had a list of of, right. of policy decisions right. made in right. various parts of the government. Um, I'm just curious, can you were, were any of them uh, things that the that 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 the financial sector opposed? No, is, is, no. Can you find any daylight all, between uh, the two? No, no, no. I think this is all, uh, you know, back to you know my my fa uh, favorite. Uh, uh, the thing that uh, I, I criticized the most were these risk-based capital rules. That was absolutely being driven by the industry, and uh, and they were, you know, they were they were drinking their own Kool-Aid, and they knew how to manage risk. And this gets back to the great moderation. They hadn't had a bank failure in three years, and they knew it, and they understood it better than the regulators, and let them use their own models and figure out how much capital they need to have. And well, it was absolutely encouraged. Uh, the derivative stuff, it was all encouraged. So I don't. Let me be clear. I'm not. <laughs> I'm not letting, letting Wall Street off the hook. I mean, it's the government's job to say no, right? And we weren't saying no as much as we should. But this is all. This was absolutely pushed by the industry. Absolutely. Well, and I mean, just I remember my first job after grad school was at the New York Fed, and I was very definitely not in bank supervision. But the the person in the next off or a few offices down who had been couple years ahead of me in grad school was running around for Bill McDonough at the BIS building the value at risk models. <laughs> and I remember walking into his office and saying, okay, what is it you're doing? And first he starts showing me all the math. And I'm like, no, no, no. What is it you're doing? We're, well, we're letting the banks tell us, you know, their approach to risk and that solves it. But, you know, that, that wasn't something that even within, say, the technocratic Fed, one could stand up and say, that doesn't sound right to yeah, me. Yeah. You know, so I, I think you and Damon are onto something about well, that. Well, and I think with, within the, the Fed, too, and I heard this at, when I was, the, the FDIC always fought it, uh, to its credit. Within the Fed, there was yeah. assumption, and the supervisor, it was the supervisors against the economists, and frankly, the economists won. And, uh, and uh, the supervisors were, you know, at a lower level, just looking at that common sense. Exactly. They knew banks, they knew what the incentives were, and the economists were looking at more theoretically. Exactly. It looked great on the blackboard, I'm sure. Yeah, yeah. that's another reason my Fed career was short. Um, we have, can we have, we're going to have to take, hold on, Jim Murray. We're going to have to take a limited number of questions. If I can ask Nicola and Bertrand to combine their questions, and then we'll go to Joe Marie and Phoebe. 
Uh, thank you, and thanks for the uh, inspiring speech. Um, Nicolas Veron here at the Institute. Uh, I will uh, connect to the discussion uh, you just had on capital standards because I think the, the limitations and shortcomings and manipulation of uh, risk-based capital standards are now well documented and well accepted. The question is what is the least bad option? And the, the standard objection to just relying on a leverage ratio, which is uh, obvious alternative is and that- And stress testing, yes. And well, but if you, if you just have a leverage ratio in terms of, uh, in technical terms, pillar one, uh, this creates, uh, because banks want to optimize or arbitrage uh, the regulations they're subjected to, this creates uh, de facto an incentive to prefer risky assets to less risky assets. Uh, so uh, the standard counter argument to the argument you made is, yeah, risk base is flawed, but if you just have leverage, you actually incentivize risk in a way that is uh, that may be even worse. So can you give us a bit more of your thinking about this trade-off thing? Thank you. Well, first of all, I, I'm, I'm hoping that the mark, I think the market is, uh, risk is dynamic, it's not static. And the market, I think, will be ahead of regulators in determining what's risky and what isn't. If you have regulators saying, don't worry, you know, you only get a 25% risk weight on a mortgage-backed security, you know, 0% on a, on a matched CDS position, you know, how does that impact uh, market thinking and market discipline? So I'm assuming even if we, if the regulators get, got rid of the rules, that define what's risky and what is. You would still have the market making some judgments, perhaps more so. You, all abs abs you absolutely need stress testing, too. But stress testing is a risk-adjusted process. It is looking at what capital solvency would look like in a very stressed scenario. And I think and it, it is dynamic, or the closest things regulators can get to dynamic, uh, then, uh, but certainly these static rules and defining and you know, these laborious every 10-year rulemaking processes What's, what's risky and what is it, and trying to calibrate and assign a particular number to it. No, I think it's harmful. I think it creates a herd mentality that's destabilizing because they just don't know. They don't know. And I think, you know, we're all in on sovereign debt now. At Ten years from now, I don't know about yeah, that. And, and, of course, also in the spirit of what you were saying earlier, uh, it creates incentive to reverse engineer the stress test or reverse engineer the risk. That said, I want to advertise again uh, our colleague Morris Goldstein has done a book for us on stress testing and bank capital, and uh, that will be out this fall, and we hope maybe we can convince there, President Baer to come yeah, out well, for that so, event. Well, there, there are no perfect tools, and I think the, the models themselves probably yeah. need, you know, it's funny, the Fed pushes the banks and the bank boards to, to validate the models and challenge. I want to make sure the Fed does that too, but I do, of the different options that are available, I'm coming around that I think a, a, a fluid stress testing supervisory process in terms of what's risk, what is currently risky on the bank's balance sheet is better than this static uh, rule writing that we have in here. Very good. Bertrand. Uh, hello, thank you very much. I'm Bertrand Banré. I'm a visiting fellow with the Peterson Institute, but uh, I will use my former hat of group CFO of two large French banks uh, throughout the financial crisis between 2007 and 2012. Uh, one of the issues that make me really suffer through that period was the, the, the number of differences between the Europe and America. Uh, cultural differences, regulatory differences, accounting differences, and the fact that yeah. analysts on both sides of the Atlantic spoke a different language, they use the same word for different con concepts, or the same concept with different words, and so on and so forth. Uh, and I'm not sure we have made much progress, actually, since that period. So that's my, my, my first point. And the second point is more uh, geoeconomics, if I may. Uh, the feeling, the perception in Europe is that this crisis started in the U.S., was engineered in the U.S. by the uh, Wall Street investment banks. And at the end of the day, they are more triumphant than ever. Uh, and the European banks, which kind of emulated them, are now on the retreat. And so the irony of all this story is that uh, Wall Street is still there right. and uh, stronger than ever. So I don't know whether you share my simplistic view. <laughs> I don't know how triumphant they are. I, I think I think reform's been a mixed bag for them. I think the the complexity of the rules has has helped them, right? Because they complain about it. At the end of the day, they can handle those are huge barriers to entry, and uh, and have upfront uh, 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 costs uh, that will disadvantage the smaller institutions. On the other hand, uh, the rules we had, it took a while to get around there, but the, the rules are tougher for them. I mean, the compensation rules are tougher. The capital rules are much tougher. It's making it harder for them uh, to make their returns on equity. I think you're seeing in increasing shareholder pressure for them to get smaller and downsize, get a little simpler to, to unleash uh, some of the inefficiencies that are created by some of these very high, highly complex organizations and just the, the regulatory hammer that comes down if you're big and complex right now. So 
it's not clear to me that they're, they're coming out winning. I think the asset managers may be, and I worry a little bit about that if we've got enough eyes on that, but uh, it's not clear to me that the big investment banks are, are, uh, are, are particularly happy about the situation that they're in now. In terms of all the different rules across, uh, across the uh, Atlantic, I agree with you, and it's, um, you know, that was the whole idea with Basel and getting the G20 and the FSB involved, and it's, there's still a lot of daylight, you're right. And I think, you know, one thing that would be huge is just to have, oh my gosh, could we just have international accounting standards for everybody? I think in terms of the capital rules in particular, they could, so much the complexity even on the leverage ratio is about different accounting rules, what's on, what's off balance sheet. So I think that that would be at the top of my list of if we're gonna homogenize the standard to please do that. And there the US has been the problem. Uh, but uh, it, it is, uh, you know, and the, the distrust is still there too, and the unwillingness to share information. I think, and I think that is that is also harmful in terms of coordination and everybody looking at the global uh, financial markets in, in a coordinated uh, in a coordinated way. I'm afraid we're getting we're getting very close to our witching hour. I, I want to give Phoebe the last question, the last Phoebe okay, last question, the last word. But Joe Marie, if you can be brief, we'll work through it. Oh, thank you very much, uh, Phoebe Miller. Okay, please. Are you comfortable with the scope of regulation in terms of shadow banks and, and, the, um, and the various entities that are in fact doing, conducting some of the activities, but all right, they may not have insured assets, in, in, I mean insured deposits, but right. uh, are conducting a lot of the same activities, yeah. sort of the Ubers of the financial industry? Yeah, no, I, I do think it's a growing concern. And, um, you know, a lot of the, uh, if, if you define shadow banking as outside the traditional, you know, banking, regulated banking sector, you know, subprime was being driven by the shadow sector. Those were not being defunded. Uh, most of those mortgages were not being funded with deposits. They were being funded, they were being originated by non-bank, non-regulated mortgage originators and, and funded through Wall Street securitizations. We had to actually go out and buy a database when I was at the FDIC because we couldn't, couldn't see what was going on because it was, you know, it was in the so-called shadow sector, but being facilitated by the regulated entities. So the big banks, were providing the warehouse fin financing, and then they were they were providing the securitizations, but they weren't none of those loans were staying on their on their balance sheet. So, um, I think uh, we missed it then, and I, I worry that we may be missing it now. And you see, liquidity drives up completely. And that's why I think if we have another crisis. It's going to be l l more led by liquidity than solvency, which is what we had in two thousand eight, uh, because that funding dries up in a nanosecond. Uh, it's, you know, the market, you know, the insured deposits will stick thanks to the FDIC and, and still fairly low, high levels of confidence in our banking system, uh, at least if you're under the insured deposit limits. So that money's still there to be able to, to lend and provide lines of credit or whatever. But the market-based funding evaporates very quickly. And I think it, 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 that is another troubling aspect of the reform uh, effort is because I think the reform, the capital rules even prior to the crisis, this continues to be the case, uh, are, are easier on trading and investment bank activities than they are in traditional lending. And that's reflected. If you look at the leverage ratio, the capital ratios for a traditional banks, a U.S. bank or a PNC, and compare that to a Goldman Sachs or a Morgan Stanley, uh, you will see much, much higher capital levels uh, at, uh, at the traditional lenders because for whatever reason, uh, and I think it's, it's the wrong reason, that... Um, the investment and market-based activities are still uh, treated with a lighter regulatory touch than traditional banking. Terrific. I think you, the few of you who didn't already know have now seen amply why Sheila Baer was such a voice of truth, of clarity, and of force, intellectual and ethical force, during the financial crisis and since. Um, we're delighted that she was able to come back and give this lecture. Uh, again, I think it couldn't have been more appropriate for the second John Olkay lecture here at the Institute, but whatever that may be, the type of thinking and the type of strong advocacy you represent is, is fantastic. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Thanks. Nice being here.